and here they all are bang on time wow big hand that was like um yeah that was that was smooth lovely to see you all how are we doing great fine thank you yeah happy to be here Good. Well, look, everyone else is very happy to be here. We've already got, you know, 150 people in the building, lots of people chatting, as you've already heard, lots of people working in, in a similar space. Um, and so what we wanted to do with this conversation is, you know, as always, go to the stories, because this is where the human stories behind these, these ideas and these businesses. Um, and then from that, start to explore where we've got to in the world of sustainable fashion and startups um, in the UK and beyond and how, we, how we're feeling about it all and what people who are listening in can learn from what you've done so far, how they can join in and support you and where we all go next, okay? So not ambitious, but we want to sort the world out, at least one industry over the next 45 minutes with a little bit of your inspiration. So are you, are you ready? Great. Yes, excellent. Um, so I thought I'd start, and I, I do that. I haven't, I haven't prepped you for this before we get into the stories. With one quick question, um, can you, th can you think of a sustainable fashion brand who's doing a brilliant job that isn't one of yours or someone else who's on the panel tonight? Um, just throw it out there because we, we can get people checking out far and wide. Yeah, Lisa, have you got one? Yeah, Ksenia Schneider, Ukrainian uh, upcycled denim fashion brand. They're really good. Okay, so then these aren't competitors; they're just doing some they great. They are competitors and inspiration, and uh, yeah, they're very successful. So hopefully, we'll be on this channel soon. Can you drop the the brand name or the link into the chat so people can, in the comments so people can look it up? Thank you for that, um, sure. Mandeep. Did you have one? Um, sure, I might just pick it. Pick I think one of the more um, commonly one commonly known sort of Patagonia. I think it's a great brand, uh, and yeah, they've just gotten better and better. Why do you think they've survived and thrived over 40 years? Like, why are they still such a go-to, like, role model in this space? Yeah, they connect with customers and, and they've really, what they say they're going to do, they really follow through on in a way that I think many brands find quite difficult. Um, and in fact, they sort of rock the boat, I think, in some of the statements they make. Um, they're like, I'm not sure our company should exist. Uh, I think that's pretty daring. Um, the, the ethos overall yeah i think the beauty of that of patagonia is they're activists first or like adventurers and activists first and like makers of fashion second which which yeah. is uh which is and they've, uh, they've lived up to those principles for a long time um arabella have you got one i do it i think it falls under the umbrella of sustainable fashion however it's a sustainable material science company called dimpora and they're really embracing that um, IP-centered B2C stroke B2B model. Uh, they're from Switzerland. Uh, they won the H&M Global Change Award with us in the same year. So I guess they're friends too. And their main thing is uh, removing chlorine from membranes in rainproof and waterproof garments, uh, which isn't really um, well known. Wow, that's great. That's a great insight. And and who are the, so their customers are people who are making what wetsuits and all sorts of products like that. So principally, uh, rainproof mountaineering type mountaineering, uh, okay. products, for example, Patagonia. Okay, so we're almost got a supply chain here that in action in those examples. Exactly. Good or a circular model. So let's start. Thank you for those, Arabella. Let's start with with your amazing story um, at Petit Pli. And I was reading, I, I heard about you before, but I read in depth about you earlier. And it's it's a brilliant story, but take us back to how it began um, in your own words um, with Ryan and his nephew. Sure. So uh, first of all, um, hands up who has a nephew or niece or any little humans in their lives. If we know a little human, okay. Okay, perfect. Nice, 50%. <laughs> Me too. So uh, Ryan, while the founder of PTC, was a student at Imperial College London and Royal College of Art studying global innovation design, decided to post a garment to his nephew Vigo in Denmark soon after his birth. But by the time it arrived, it was really too small, which signaled that a uh, there was a lot of planned obsolescence by design within children's wear, and b there was a uh, a bevy of poor customer experiences. Uh, and see, that was a problem to fix. And as he has a background in aeronautical engineering, he decided to use his, his knowledge into deployable satellite uh, structures, along with origami, to design something that could grow with uh, 
Vigo. Uh, so uh, from that, that provided the basis uh, and the hunger to identify material which could grow. And from then, uh, we've grown from children's wear to create one size fits all masks and uh, one size fits all adult wear, um, which allows for um, increased efficiency along the supply chain. But I can go into more into that later. Well, well that. listen, I'm going to like rudely interrupt you straight okay. away because you, what okay. you said in the last 30 seconds is like mm. so, so much and so interesting. So first of all, how long did it take for that package to get delivered, by the way, to to the, to the his nephew, to Ryan's well, nephew? I think it was pre-Brexit, pre-GT. So from logistics <laughs> knowledge today, um, it probably would have been three to five days, depending right. on the... the logistics center <laughs> so there you go there, there's an insight humans grow fast and even even more so now that delivery services have slowed down i guess um secondly uh, explain to uh, someone like me what does planned obsolescence mean in the making of a product so uh i guess that is uh by design uh creating products uh for the sole purpose of being replaced uh, sooner than needed. I think that's a neat way to say it. And that, and that echoes across, that's partly we have a crisis of, of uh, climate and you know the, the fact that the fashion is the world's second largest polluter is like that's that's one of the core reasons for it right these things aren't designed to last or to be circular. So that was the big driver for setting up Petit Plea. Now tell us a little bit more about the innovation because if you look at if you look at these images while we're chatting by the way um, everyone who's watching on Petit Please site, you'll see. I mean, it feels like it looks and feels like this sort of future, yeah. future clothing. Um, yeah. uh, what? How did you origami style? You know, how did he come up with this? Like, what was the process to go through the first couple of iterations? Was it dead simple, or did it take a lot? How did he fund that initial one? When did you join in? <laughs> yeah, sure. Okay, so I think the short answer is. Persistence, experimentation, and persistence. <laughs> and then the long answer is, uh, well, uh, on account of us being a human-centered uh, company, uh, we really value uh, feedback and interviewing um, the real case users. So uh, the first step was speaking to Vigo, <laughs> speaking to the parents. And because uh, at that point, Ryan obviously didn't and still doesn't have children. and none of us in the team do we're all really young <laughs> so uh our we've got an interesting business use case where our principal consumers will never buy our garments so we really need to understand the lives and the lifestyles of the users which are sure. little humans uh so we ha we went out and uh went to the field went to the london wetland center if you've ever been there to barn it's great great family trip um or great uh under 20 something trip too um and saw how little humans were actually uh running around and how uh, their current design garments were restrictive. And then hmm. from that, we, from that user feedback, then we under, went to the drawing board and see what could stick. And then um, this origami type design was uh, a concept which then went on to the UK James Dyson Award in 2017. Hmm. That from then, um, thankfully um, it went viral and caught uh, global attention. All around the world which is super cool which showed that there are lots of uncles and do you yeah, think it course. it spread so from a marketing point of view because you really did get a lot of attention very quickly mm -hmm. did it spread because of the concept or because of the look or was it the combination of the two well i think uh, on account of ryan's background being uh, rooted in science but then having an interest in photography um okay it was very serendipitous that at the point of the graduate exhibition the look of Petit Plea and the, the name of the company uh, was formed as the student project. So the title okay. of the brand is the student project name, uh, yeah. which is great. <laughs> super cool. Yeah. Uh, so and it's a great story. <laughs> and I love yeah. how you last question, then I'm coming to, yeah, to the Arc Defo team. Um, so you describe yourself as principally a material technology company. Well, like, can you can you explain a little bit more about that? So principally, we consider ourselves a material science company. Uh, realizing innovations uh, derived from human-centered feedback systems. So uh, our core to particularly is IP. And I think that's a really huge differentiator between uh, a brand and a materials company because so often within the fashion industry, which I'm sure um, the other panelists might share more on, uh, especially the big brands, they don't actually develop materials. 
um, and there's a lot of capital involved with generating IP. So for that reason, um, it's fitting and more transparent to be communicated as such. Fantastic. Thank you, Arabella. Lots more to ask you. Um, so, Andrew and Lisa, tell us how your little venture started. And was this the first project you have done together? Yeah, um, it started by me getting sick as a woman, not being able to find clothes that fits me. And then slowly but surely questioning how are the prices of fast fashion are so cheap. Mm. Uh, I've been making all my life. It's kind of, you know, the family <laughs> thing runs in my blood. And since I moved to Edinburgh first, I just started making clothes for myself and I ditched buying. And then I designed online courses to teach people how you can make it in a very simple and effective way. So stuff that you buy in the shops and change all the time, like jumpers, t-shirts, trousers, you can do it yourself and it's really simple. And then it kind of developed. So, so on that, sorry to, sorry to interrupt Lisa, but that's really interesting from a startup point of view. So you, you started doing online classes and what site did you do this on? Uh, Podia. Podia, it's, okay. It's, uh, yeah, one of the hosting platforms. I think they're all American. Um, it's highly recommended to everyone who wants to start an online uh, classes business. It's super user friendly, and you can hook up it to your. Yeah, you create a sub domain to your main uh, website. Yeah. And, and did it, it generate good revenue for you that doing that? Yeah, but it's, it's still a bit harder here. It feels like it was pre pandemic uh, we started. Okay. Uh, but it's a bit uh, resistance in people in online learning. They expect like, you know, the Zoom meeting and it's just like high quality, pre-recorded video tutorials. It still takes some time to, um, why you can watch it for free on YouTube. Why pay us? Because there is no advertisement, because it's a system, because you learn it once, you know, it stays for life. Mm. So that. And on the on the back of that, since I was making and just sharing stuff on um, on socials, people were asking if I'm selling, and I was resistant for a long time. And then we started researching the whole sustainability from materials to production chains to everything. And then uh, Andrew, former architect, uh, <laughs> uh, lost his job last year. Found it again. Yeah, and we started doing it together, and we started with we we were thinking how to approach the message of the importance of sustainability in fashion because the courses they're great, but they don't show you visuals. So okay. how can you you need a ready-made garment to show that what you can do, mm. and our research led us to denim. I think Andrew has more numbers on the yeah. Why yeah. why denim, Andrew? Well, as Lisa was saying, the, the whole idea was that the courses were difficult for, I think, the public in Britain mainly to understand. They weren't really there yet in terms of online learning. So we needed something that was a visual that they could see and touch, you know, taste, touch and smell. And fortunately, we're still doing that online. But, you know, um, the reason we went with denim is, is because everyone knows what denim is. You know, if you want to try to start something straightforward in terms of our business model is to save clothes from going to waste. So we're looking at the material that's the end of life. And then there's so much of it, it's like 70 million pairs are sold in the UK like every year. There's just like denim everywhere, you know? So that was obviously one that people understand. If you say denim, you know what it is. If someone says a cotton shirt or whatever, you can go, oh, what is it? So it was an easier one to start off with. It's iconic, it's hard wearing pretty much we can work with that and it's durable. So that was the reason for us starting there. And that's the reason why we had the snappy title of uh, Donate Denim, because we collect in Glasgow. So we engage with the public um, and it's good to get to tell them about us, what we're doing and why we're doing it as well, which is mainly the reduce waste, save stuff from landfill, reuse what is actually still pretty good material because denim, mm knees or it's the kind of crotch area apart from that the rest is and fine that's the stuff that you cannot you can donate to charity shops but they can't resell it to consumers they only resell it to textile merchants which then has a very sad destiny mostly somewhere in the landfill not in this country yeah yeah that, so, there's, a, there's a depressing realization isn't there that a lot of charitable donations don't end up in landfill and don't don't get resold or reused um and so with denim itself like the one that one the 
the lessons for me listening to this story is that you have a really clear way of engaging your future customers through them giving in the first place and learning about the journey of this this uh, this item, right? So what happens next? How, how difficult is it to then to remake and to and sell? <laughs> well, uh, good advice to everyone who wants to upcycle, buy yourself a pair of electric scissors. They exist and they do okay. wonders. <laughs> Um, but yeah, it's very time consuming. We cut uh, each pair of jeans by hand first to like rectangular shapes to create bigger panels for the patchwork. And then we use the rest. It's kind of, it's never ending. So our final product are door stoppers. We fill them with the denim off cuts. So it's like, it's zero waste. It's everything goes back in and it's um, made to order. So we don't have, this way. <laughs> We, uh, we don't have uh, stock. We just started making small stocks of uh, like little coin purses or door stoppers that people can see, you know, they're on, the, on the cheaper side, they can, on the more affordable side, they can buy it right away. But with jackets or trousers, it's so time consuming. We can't afford to be making random sizes from a random design book. Uh, it's, again, it's back to my personal problem as a woman. I want mm. to make clothes based on your measurements. So it's mostly relaxed fit, so it's easy to get measured in line. So we offer a few solutions. And altogether, I think each item has about 80 size variations. So you can customize the length, the, the width, and make something that, so we will make something for you that fits you. And that's the whole idea, that once you invest, once you spend time and money and, you know, waiting time, because it takes about four to eight weeks to make one garment, and then you take care of this item. So for us, yes, we think that this, the, the bigger goal is behavioral change of stopping this fast buying, fast fashion, and to slow down the slow process of slow buying, slow making, and wearing for a long time, like you know your grandfather's uh, mm. blazer. It's very important. And we think that with this way, by creating items and showing visually, what it is and what can be done with this is waste material. This is post consumer waste, but it can be transformed into something new and be worn for many years to come and uh, change the world. <laughs> One quote that No, don't shrug the shoulder. Change it. It is changing the world. No, you're telling the story so brilliantly tonight. And final quick question before I come to Mandeep um, How's it going? Like, what's, what are the numbers? What's the response been like? Um, it's kind of it's, it's still quite slow and i think it's because it's not it's made to order it's like andy was saying earlier on made mm. to order with a delay between that there's no instant gratification that given the, the volume of fast fashion is a real hard sell to the public is that you can have it but you have to wait a few weeks um and that's that's proving to be uh, a harder message i think the, than we originally guessed it would be because we thought the great story would be there's no waste here you know there's no stock that's going to get burned or landfill that's we make it when you buy it but that whole yeah but i want it now mentality is is a difficult one so it's it's a bit slower than we'd hoped well, it's a, it's a good challenge for for this community to think about tonight so whilst we're whilst we're carrying on have a think about how could how might um Lisa and Andrew market their products so that the the delay is actually something that's compelling and exciting. I mean, we we've seen it work in other industries. I'm thinking of Morgan Cars, like you order one and you get it five years later. That kind of old school classic approach to products of the, and then and then their worth is more because it's being made for you. Uh, it's so fascinating, right? We're gonna we've got more to talk about, but over to Mandeep next. Mandeep, when did your journey with into the world of sustainable fashion start? Yeah, not. It's pretty recent, to be honest. Uh, this is not what I've been doing. Um, previously, I worked uh, in kind of the corporate world for a number of years. Uh, and actually, when Bendy came about, it was I was working at a data science startup here in London. Really, really interesting stuff. And they made you know, tools on demand for a number of different companies. And basically, they, they would go in and scope a project and help uh, a company maybe sell more products through better recommendations or help that company lose less customers by sort of personalizing various things. And it was, it was a super interesting kind of insight into how data science, so AI effectively mm. in the kind of traditional sense 
is being used by a range of different companies. And it's, it's, it's about, you know, how we're we using our data. Um, so around that same time, a friend of mine, uh, Ben, so it's Mandeep and Ben, that basically makes the Bendy. Um, I've known him for about 18 years. We went to university together. He did something really different, uh, went off and worked in sustainability. He worked at you know, companies like the Carbon Disclosure Project and NGOs such as that. And then sustainability, more specifically in fashion, and worked as part of the sustainability team at Burberry here in, a Lon in London for a number of years before working at the Global Fashion Agenda, which is over in Denmark and brings together lots of different brands uh, around the topic of sustainability. And so he'd seen well, lots of challenges internally. And he was like, you know, huge companies are still using pretty simple like data tools, effectively just using Google Sheets or Excel to manage data around sustainability. And they want to be able to, you know, track what's happening in their supply chain. And they want to mm. say something about, oh, carbon zero or net zero. And tracking and managing and performing according to these goals is quite complex. So if you're using Excel to do that, uh, it's not going to be particularly easy. You just have to keep adding more people. So when we got together, we were like, oh, this this sounds like a problem that we should we should work on. And one year later, uh, one and a half years later, here we are. And, and so you've got this principle of like, we're going to help people uh, understand the transparency of their supply chains better or, or consumers doing it. Then where, where do you just, where do you start? Right. What's your first kind of version of a service? Like, what, what, what did you start with? So we actually started with something different, like classic startup. We we've already pivoted once. Basically, we we started off building a tool for consumers because we were consumers ourselves. And it's like, OK, I have this problem. I wish that I knew what the impact of a product was. I wish just, you know, just like all birds, I wish that for every product I could see how do I compare this to this? And yeah. kind of, the average consumer, that's what you want to know. You're like, is this more sustainable or is this yeah. more sustainable? In reality, after you know spending some time in this in this field, it's not such an easy question to answer. And it's very much, well, it depends. If you're looking at sustainability through a lens of maybe how people are treated, then this one might be better because we know more about the ethical yeah. implications of this product. But if you're looking to minimize, let's say, your carbon footprint, well, this might be better. So these are really complicated sort of questions. And, and, and as a consumer, we know people just want to know the answer. So we were trying to build something, a tool, kind of using design, you know, human-centered design principles to try and answer those questions as easily as possible. But we were also just using public data. So we really quickly realized that there were a couple of things that we needed. We needed better data in order to really say something valuable. But also there was this view of like sustainability literacy. Most people uh, kind of conceptually know what sustainability is, but they don't know the nuances, nor do they really want to uh, kind of get stuck into there. Only some people do. Kind of like what you were saying, um, people want to change, but shifting behavior is really hard. Mm. So once we started, we were like, okay, great. It's, in order to solve this problem, we need to start speaking to brands more directly. So that's what we've been doing for the last six months. We're working with a retailer here in the UK and a number of brands and really helping them to understand what their sustainability looks like. Um, we look at sustainability at the moment uh, across 18 different verticals, uh, broadly across sourcing, people and planets. Uh, and yeah, lots and lots of detail within that, something like chemicals and waste and, of course, your emissions and your water footprints and, and so much, so much more than that. So I think sustainability is more than carbon footprinting, but this is now working directly with brands. We're seeing, you know, a huge amount of effort already being put into um, trying to address a number of things in their supply chain and, and their sustainability overall. So I think it's a really great time, to be honest, to be to be working in this space. Yeah, it's, but it also... I'm just imagining your dashboard, right? We all have our little dashboards, don't we? We're tracking our business and you've got like, oh, we've just got our 18 verticals and then it, that doesn't even include your own numbers. I was like, whoa, that's why you need to build this great tech. But when we met, and just to just to wrap up the story at this point, Mandy, when we met, you were, you know, Bendy was a, like almost like a plugin into your browser that you'd like go onto an H&M or, or a shop online and you could like 
overlay it over a product and kind of see, oh, is it a traffic light? Yes, it's green, it's sustainable, go ahead. Obviously, it's not if it's on H&M. <laughs> Unless it's in their conscious collection, which means the rest of their stuff's completely un unconscious. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, sorry, calm down, calm down. Anyway, um, so what what happened? what's happened then? Because you moved away from that. You've won a couple of business clients. Is that right? Yeah, so we we did move away from it in some ways, but ultimately we think really interesting stuff that what we learned from that was what consumers care about. Uh, interestingly, okay. Arabella, we we were we also thought starting with children's clothing because there's so much waste in it would be the right place. So we ended up speaking to a hundred parents of who Ben kindly was one of them. Um, and from that we really sort of uh, built on what does this thing look like? And now we're taking that to brands and Brands are really interested in putting something like that on their website uh, that consumers can click through, but it'll be a hell of a lot more detailed than that thing that we built or were trying to build, um, you know, nine months ago. So that's great. It's so it's so interesting. All all your all your projects and businesses. Okay, so I'm going to start throwing out some other questions here, and I'm going to see some coming in uh, from the crowd as well. So if you've got questions, chuck them up, and we'll try and get them answered. Um, but more generally, and Arabella, let's come back to you, and then it's open to whoever to jump in. Um, what's been the biggest challenge and the most surprising thing about the journey in your sustainable fashion so far? Um, so Arabella, kick us off. What's been, what's been surprising? Like you've gone into this, uh, material technology business. You're like getting all this attention from around the world. You're, you're getting a your PR machine seems to be rolling. The product seems to be getting attention, uh, getting traction. What's been, uh, what's been surprising about that? And what's now your challenge? Um, Big question, because it's reducing, I think, <laughs> the entire journey. But I'd say uh, if I was to reduce the entire journey to one strap line, I think it's a really general statement which reaches across all people who are creating their own businesses. And it's not having a map. The way I describe <laughs> developing a company is altitude climbing uh, in freak weather storms with um, no GPS and the satellites are down. <laughs> I think it's just uh, having the the grit and uh, and also uh, remembering to have the grit when you're too tired to think. <laughs> so and, I think and that's uh, just the difficulty, just not yeah. knowing. And where do you get that grit? Is it internally? Is it through your team? Like what keeps you focused? Because you're because you know, from the outside here, and we we've not been working on this for the for the number of years. We've only just been discovering and getting excited about it. But it looks it looks like you know you're building a very successful uh, product. You're carving out a new space. You're being disruptive, if you want to use that word, um, even though it's overused. Um, so like how how you like because you're trying you like all of you are innovating. So how in a, in a true sense, not in a bullshit sense. So how are you staying like true to like the innovation, the principles and all of that? And when you're up a mountain and blind and, and freezing and the rest of it, what keeps you keeps you going? Is it is it the is it the vision or is it just like we're committed or is it something else? Uh, so I think uh, for the team, uh, definitely being united by uh, vision and also uh, for customers to join that journey and users to join that journey that's um, integral however I think for myself personally it's always having a value for ideas first I think of myself as someone who values ideas and um, have learned that the importance of not letting them die and I think mm. if outside of a brand outside of a company if you value concepts and realizing them then you can move mountains I love when you circle a metaphor like that in an answer. Well played. Wasn't scripted, everyone. It just happened naturally. Beautiful. Uh, Andrew and Lisa, is it the same for you? Like, is it this, is it this, like the grit and the focus or is it working together? Like, what's the challenge? And also, what's been surprising so far for you? Surprising from the point if we just go like into material in terms of denim, surprising how little 100% cotton denim is there on the market and people buy. About 30% of donations we receive is 100% cotton. The rest is poly mixed something, which is like, you know, cheap jagging stuff 
which is very surprising, just which is just says a lot about uh, the society we're living in. People yeah. keep on buying bad quality in massive quantities, and that is stuff that we have to use, find a way how to use it because you know we commit it. But sometimes mm. you just feel like. I think the thing is we 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 are committed to it. We've basically taken on in fact, more other side projects as well, but taking on all aspects just simply because, it, well, from up here anyway, it doesn't seem like anyone really is. There's no joined up thinking. So somebody has to, and somebody may ask the question, is like, well, you two aren't from the fashion. Well, you don't have a St. Martin's degree between you. How, how <laughs> dare you, you know? And it's like, well, well, someone has to, and nobody with a St. Martin's degree is doing it. Sorry if you've got St. Martin's degree. <laughs> but that's what I think. Another thing is we haven't killed ourselves yet. I mean, we're basically living together, working together 24-7. That's all we think. And we're married couple, business partners. I guess the challenge is that we talk the same stuff all the time, back and forth 24-7. So yeah. this whole like uh, work-life uh, balance nonsense. Just hang on, hang on a second. Here. Andrew, are you saying that the biggest challenge is not fixing the world of fashion, but working working with Lisa? Are you going to be careful here? I think it's a joy every single day. Uh, my, day used, my day used to be I had to leave to go to work. And, okay. And now I, now I can stay. Okay. I just yeah. Have to bounce ideas of, you know, other people because like, sanity check, like, is it what, is it needed? Why are we doing that? And sometimes, yeah, sometimes you, you see the mount and then you go like, is it yeah. worth it? And you just keep on climbing and falling down and climbing again and it's never ending, um, but it's fun and... Yeah. But what what's fun? Because this is important. Because I like we're hearing this mountain metaphor again, and it's a, it's a good one. Um, but pushing the big rock up the mountain or climbing in the dark is like this putting people off here, right? So, what's the fun element of this for you, Lisa? The the moment when there's like little little successes. They're really tiny, but sometimes you know, sometimes you just yeah. Sometimes I just cry because it feels so helpless and nothing is working. And then the next moment. Pum, and it's moving and this little every single movement it's so worth it that you forget about all those you know uh, doubts and whatever uh, negative emotions the i just think that yeah everybody says that fashion business is so hard and i'm also i'm not coming from fashion so i didn't think about it yeah it's really hard but the best thing is not to think about the fact that it's so hard and just go for it uh yeah. just somehow like you know close your ears and listen to anyone and keep pushing because eventually it's it's breaking you you slowly but surely get in there yeah i would say that um i spent 25 years working for the man in architecture and i can't say i enjoyed it and i have to say to you in all honesty the last two years of working on this project has been the best thing i've ever done and you know i have complete control of my day to a certain degree, obviously, you're chasing people down, but I have control of my day, my destiny. We work together. And, you know, if I had known all this beforehand, I would have probably gone self-employed a lot earlier. It's it's honestly been the best thing. Uh, and instead of sitting blaming somebody else for all the ills of your day, it's, there's no one else to blame. It's our responsibility how we build this. It's the best it's thing we've ever done. It's a beautiful answer, and it reminds me of um, a, a quote I heard the other day, which is, "We need to feel necessary as humans, especially in the in the, in it, when we're up against these giant crises that we're now aware of, and, um, and and the fashion industry is at the heart of it all, right? And so all of you are doing something that's necessary, and that's what inspires us to keep going. And so, so it's really important we reflected on that for a minute. Thank you, uh, Mandeep. Um, in in Bendy, like, what is it that's really challenging, and what's what's surprising? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to stick with this map metaphor that we're using. I think I think it's probably one of the biggest challenges, but it's also really surprising because we've been drawing our own map, right? We turn up and we're like, okay, we think this is the direction and we have conversations with consumers, we have conversations with possible clients, we have conversations with investors, with wonderful people like yourself um, and with the team. And it's like, yeah, okay, that sounds good. Let's let's go into that dark wood or, you know, up this really steep hill. And I think that's maybe I shouldn't find it surprising, but it has been, I mean, really pleasantly so, uh, which I think as you creep up the next, you know, difficult ridge, 
you realize, okay, I can do that. That's amazing. Um, I think at the beginning of this talk, you were talking about the marathon or something, sometimes completing kind of a sprint. Uh, so how we work is in agile sprints and just even getting to the end of it feels like you've completed a marathon, but you've got to do another one, but that's fine because you've, you've won this one. So it, I think it's hugely rewarding um, and not having a map isn't, isn't always a bad thing. But yeah, it, it puts a lot of terror because you, you could think, well, what if I took them up this path and this isn't the right one? But, you know, everyone's up for the challenge and that's that's really good fun. All right, it's exciting when you're carving the path. Um, so so coming down from the summits of uh, that metaphor, um, some practical questions. Vivian asks, what are the panel's views on packaging in an online business, just starting a luxury brand and struggling with it? So feel free to jump in. How do we package sustainably? So um, maybe this is an annoying answer for you, Vivian, but we created our own. <laughs> so um, so we have, maybe I can grab one. We yeah, have show it, uh, show for it. our humans, wait, one second. All right, whilst, whilst Arabella's looking, what are, what are the packaging for you, Lisa? How do you do it? Uh, we're still developing the best way for that. Um, we've had a lot of, we've, we're trying to, when you want to try and create experience and you're hitting a certain price level that you want to achieve then the experience is very important but at the same time is it like experience over material and all that because sometimes you know the experience uh, is, is, is it, not very sustainable I mean, I mean yeah is, is the box coming from China for example just to ship it to Bristol that's not very sustainable so there, yeah and also preferable to us we would be sourcing something that's UK based because that's going to reduce everything but finding the right answer we found a few but they're not they're not the right answer yet it's a difficult one yeah Arabella have you found your product yeah I'm just going to link it so everyone can see it okay, okay so um because on account of creating garments that obviously grow. Uh, we don't have the problem of inefficient sizing, but also it will always fit. So we have 2% returns, which is great, which yeah. is really low for a company within the fashion space. Um, however, we thought, hey, if they're being used for a long time and we're being spent, we want to create zero waste packaging too. So we have like, a scent in a box and then you it can unfold. And if you follow these instructions, they turn into a jetpack. Uh, which then can be then worn around uh, and then used by the little human. A so little human jetpack, which is beautifully exactly. connected back to to Ryan's story as an, being a yeah aeronautical exactly. engineer. Yeah, nice. And and Mandeep, have you discovered innovative packaging um, through the brands you're working you work? with? Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's this, there's a real range, but trying to use materials that are already um, sort of from recycled materials is, is a great start uh, trying to reduce the waste so have those packaged materials actually be recyclable um, I think is, is another way to reduce end-of-life waste yeah but there's yeah there's a range of different provisions around that um, but I like the idea of okay you can actually make your packaging into a toy that's great yeah secondary uses is always always the answer um, so Andy's also, just Gamifying nudges behavior, which is a soft way to change behavior. It is, it is, isn't it? Yeah, that's a good reminder. Make it playful. Um, and uh, Andrew and Lisa, Andy has just said that sharing my recent experience of the painted jacket, where I had to wait eight weeks for it to arrive, one of the interesting things was being able to follow the journey of the jacket being produced, learning about the sourcing, the material, the coloring process, right down to the label and buttons. And I think we've seen this more and more, like this, people who do good storytelling through these through these brands. Um, so you can go on this journey, like who made this or where did it come from and um, and so on. So that's that's a good reflection for us. Um, another question here. Uh, Andrew talks about there being no joined up thinking collaboration. Give the size of the challenge. What are the panel's thoughts on making some of the knowledge around sustainability open source so that everyone has a better chance of building a better business? Orba shared some of their tools earlier in the year, for example. Are you seeing that, Mandeep, in your work? Yeah, I mean, it's it's super interesting around the Allbirds calculator, for example. You know, we had a look at it. It's it's pretty it's a pretty standard tool, right? And it's already available. It's based on the GHG protocol for a product lifecycle. M much of that information is publicly available. But when we speak to, I think, especially smaller brands, those that um, 
don't have an in-house sustainability person, which is actually the majority of them, then they just don't have the time and the resource to do this. Um, it, it's always, yeah, I could have all these hundred million one things to do for my brand, to sell my products, to return things, whatever it might be. So doing this additional piece of work is expensive. So there's a lot of free resources out there already. Um, I think we will certainly make a number of resources available, uh, whether you are a paying customer or not over time. Um, we're still kind of starting that journey, but there's something that's needed to help someone get from zero to one, which is, okay, I can go read this or I can go watch something, but how do I implement this in my business? And, uh, and what are the steps that I need to do? And not just today, but tomorrow, because sustainability is a journey, right? And, and you might be doing particularly well in another thing, but, but not so much in one. So, I mean, our solution is supposed to make that, it will eventually make that kind of cheap and accessible to the majority of brands. That's our long-term vision for Bendy. Yeah. Um, sorry, Arabella, sorry. go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, just on that also, just to be realistic, I think uh, what has just both been mentioned is access to education, but also from a consumer point, uh, lead times with receiving it but the consumer doesn't know the lead time for receiving the materials as the business so these tools are great for understanding what the cost is but obviously it's a business so there's a cash flow element too so would it be feasible to put a pre-order for a very sustainable uh, material which you learn about through the all birds mechanism let's say or you measure it but then um, it has to be ordered a year in advance because there are there's such little demand for that type of material around the world so the lead time is uh monumental and obviously for a small brand that needs money at least something to um, go from month to month and then there's a pre-order and um, that's more the conversation and the limiting factor but it's not the sourcing it's the infrastructure around it thank you arabella that's, that's helpful. And I want to throw a big question out here or a challenge to you because you, you're all so impressive in what you're doing. But if we step back a minute and look at the scale of the problem and the systemic change that's needed in the supply chains, uh, not, not just in terms of materials, um, but to stop these fast fashion being sold so cheaply to start paying people all the way through to the end of the supply chains, living wages, all the human rights issues with that. Shouldn't we be putting, if we care about this, solving this problem in the world, shouldn't we be putting all our efforts and energies into activism, into politics, into trying to change those big decisions, to getting into like working inside bigger businesses to try and change them? Why, why, sh why should we put our energy into startups instead? Well, I think startups are more agile and are more likely to be geared up to take on these challenges. The big businesses are far too too far gone, I think. Um, you know, no, no one's really got the appetite or the ability to change the system. Um, you know, if, if the system is to burn or to landfill and that is cheaper than changing it, if they can mm. get away with not changing it, they won't change it. And you can... Talk to all the politicians you want, but if politicians are somehow influenced by by business and business decisions, uh, as in, well, we'll take our jobs from the high street, and therefore that means politically that looks bad for you. That's always the problem. Small businesses are agile, but people have to give small businesses a chance. I think you know they're they're too easily um, they get a lot of time for the big business with the name. But that doesn't necessarily mean that their journey is actually uh, a good journey. It's, it's usually not. The small business is at its core uh, is, is better. It's, it, everything is based on what it's going to do, is to change something, to improve something, or to make people's lives better. They're the easier ones to make it, but there's a lot of them. So like a thousand bees is better than one bee. Thank you, Andrew. That's a great answer. Um, Arabella Mandeep, do you want to jump in on this? Um, I have an answer. Uh, it might be a bit strange, uh, but it works with that pollination uh, metaphor. And I think it's a consequence of reading a little symposium on plant virology, anyway, which is super random, but stick with me. So I think, yeah, you described like a really endemic problem, which is a result of the system. So let's say like potatoes. 
it's like the potato disease. So there are all these potatoes like cropping up, some are growing, uh, like, but the yield is low and farmers are pretty unhappy and then there's not enough like potatoes to then match with your roast chicken. So lots of people then start figuring out like, oh my gosh, what is an anti, uh, a seed which has like the antiviral property? And then basically like loads of little people start like creating like their own little um, antiviral like potato. And then as soon as one sticks, then it can be um, washed out. So maybe unfortunately, uh, what with the COVID reference uh, that has been um, plagued our lives <laughs> throughout 2020, maybe it's an unhappy metaphor to hear. But I think uh, I think startups are that German Pfizer uh, offshoot who were nimble enough um, and agile enough to create a solution. And then once, once uh, realized and proved, it's easier to replicate. So um, I think that's why people should um, should uh, continue supporting startups uh, because if we've learned anything from this year, it wasn't it wasn't Pfizer proper. It was Pfizer small. Yeah, uh, and that's so it's an amazing example of like how an idea because it was forced into reality got accelerated and is is changing the world like or saving the world from from this this pandemic um mandeep what's your perspective you're further up the supply chain in some ways you are trying to influence the big players um like what's your feeling on like how where you where you focus your energy and your ideas yeah i mean from a very personal perspective i've worked at um huge corporates multinational organizations and I think they can be pretty innovative, but only to a certain extent, right? And uh, I agree with a, a number of things the other panelists have said, but it, it's because a startup is agile, you know, we we shifted our entire business model within a matter of like, we did something for three months, four months, and we were like, no, nah, it doesn't work. Okay, great. I only have to tell eight other people. And then next morning we wake up and we're doing something else and we just forget that other thing. But when you're working in a large corporate of, tens of thousands of people, that's really, really difficult to do. So even if you're betting on the wrong horse, you just keep going. I think there's a little bit of that around your ability to take on risk and your ability to change and truly be agile is, is much easier when you're a startup. And sort of possibly kind of like that uh, potato example, but another one from food. Um, if I think of uh, the meat industry in particular, um, you know, the amount of like vegan meat that's now available is I think so competitive in the sense that McDonald's now does a veggie burger. I mean, I've been a vegetarian for my whole life and it's like, I remember as a kid having no vegetarian options at McDonald's and now there's a veggie burger and that's because it costs as much. It's um, absolutely delicious and so incredibly com competitive. And I think we're coming up with things like that. And that was done by a startup, right? Essentially, so these kinds, McDonald's didn't go away and develop their own meat-free product, and neither did any of the other big kind of food producers. And again and again, we see this disruption coming from small companies that are really highly innovative, that have a set of skills, that then just focus their efforts into solving a small problem that then is kind of highly disruptive and washes over industry. And I think there's a lot of that happening um, in fashion in particular as well. And yeah, so that comes from startups. Amazing, an amazing defense of startups, which we don't need to give to this audience, but it's good to challenge ourselves. And essentially, this conclusion that, you know, brilliant ideas well executed do change and shape our world for the better. So, so thank you for doing it. I've got one final question I want to squeeze in because it's really important. By the way, Luke's asking down here about trying to find sustainable clothing manufacturers in London. If anyone can help with Luke with that, jump in the chat. Come, come backstage afterwards, Luke, to the session and we'll try and help, help you with that. My final question um, is on behavior change. So a lot of us here tonight are all, uh, you know, trying to be more conscious consumers, consider our impact and also influence our friends, family through our social media and our networks. And we'll now all talk about what the work that you're doing. Um, but what have you learned about behavior change that works? So something in your own journeys, Arabella, you already mentioned that what you do with the packaging and gamifying that so that it gets reused and repurposed. But is there, can you give me one example each of like, here's where we're seeing behavior change through what the work we're doing in terms of people uh, focusing more on sustainable fashion um, that's that's been effective, been successful. Yeah, go for it, Andrew. Um, Lisa. We, we, uh, so we have online teaching school. It's dressmaking. It's from fashion design to sewing. 
And we had a chance to teach this summer the kids in one of the deprived areas, like a summer school, just 12 days, couple of hours a day. And that was a phenomenal shift because you explain to them. So while teaching how to make stuff, you also, you know, lecture a little bit on what's going on in the fashion industry, this and that, ask them questions, ask them what brands they're wearing, what they're buying. And after that, working with uh, patchwork, upcycling, making their own clothes with their measurements and really struggling with that, but making it happen, realizing that a hoodie can't cost 25 pounds. Mm-hmm. That was a massive shift. And every time you ask them, what do you think now? It was right away like, no, I'm not buying that anymore. So through teaching, through educating and through putting them through the experience of actually making it, there is a tiny bit of shift happening and hopefully... Uh, they'll keep on, you know, making and investing in the future when they grow up into better. Clothes. I love that example, Lisa. Participation is the best form of education, and therefore be- behavior change. Fantastic. Any others, Arabella or Mandeep? Yeah. Go for it. <laughs> okay. Sure. So um, I think one of the things that we've found is is been received really well by um, all, from all the consumer research that we've done directly with um, people who are buying things is around product stories. Uh, just telling them some impact number uh, means not doesn't mean very much. It's like okay, this product used I don't know ten kilos of carbon. It's like what does that mean? Um, how do I contextualize this? Does it mean sometimes you can use things like ah oh, this this is the equivalent of you taking 10 um, car journeys from here to wherever. And and so that's a little bit helpful. But the thing mm. that we found that really brings people along is a kind of a journey of that product. It was thought about in this way. Um, it was made so and such, and it was made out of this material. It was designed mm. to be worn a hundred times. And at the end of this life, here are all the things that you can do with it. And here's the factory it was made. It doesn't necessarily have to be a person, but that uses a lot of this kind of psychology of connecting people to the products that they buy, that that those products have been, you know, touched by other human beings. And of course, uh, all of these environmental impacts that are related with it, that are so much bigger than this, just like this carbon number. I also like with that, and I don't know who's, who's exploring it, like the kind of data goal. So imagine you're like, your goal is to wear this a hundred times. <clears throat> and I know that lots of people always think about, well, this costs me this much. Therefore, if I, the more I wear it or the more I use it, the cheaper it gets, right, in terms of the value I got from it. So I wonder if there's a play on that, like, oh, if my goal is to wear it a hundred times and you've got a tracker, an app, which is like how many times or even built into the clothing, like because the average is obviously seven or something pathetic, right? So... And it's like, it almost like the clothing could warn you. It's like, hang on a second. I've got 77 to go, my friend. Put it back on. Or, or in Lisa and Andrew's case, you've got like 300, you know, at least to go. So um, this is this is where it gets exciting. Arabella, you are doing some amazing things around behavior change. So any other examples for us? So, yeah. So I think I'm going to, <laughs> sounds random, but because uh, the other panelists shared such uh, robust and consumer um, examples, I think what's important is mm-hmm. to communicate um, that there's two ways to um, communicate and enforce behavior change. And we always talk about top down, straight bottom up approaches and consumer change uh, for the end product is definitely uh, bottom up, but top down, um, I think, which is really exciting. For- Arabella, you just went, for some reason, your voice uh, went robotic. Are you back? In the 21st century, since the last uh, recession was the democratization of uh, retail investments. So now consumers can actually own a company. So um, through that, um, what I mentioned earlier with the jet packaging, uh, we're trying to game Mafi and provide some playfulness uh, to zero waste packaging. But the real way to gamify, unfortunately, adult behavior is through actually understanding monetary behaviors. So um, actually with Virgin and uh, Crowdcube, we are launching our own uh, crowdfunding campaign on Crowdcube. So I just linked it there. So uh, within that space, there's a whole company journey. So uh, that's an education piece for the anyone who wants to invest and change the company if they believe in the idea and the mission. So they understand not only um, 
its growth potential, but also there's stronger empathy with the end product. And then there's an evangelism incentive for the customer too, because they're personally invested. So, um, and I think that's also why Virgin wanted to uh, Virgin Money and Andy, who ran a great pro program with Crowdcube, wanted to to join their democratization of retail investment too, because of the potential. Yeah, it's a lovely way to wrap up our conversation. And I think it echoes that example, Arabella, echoes nicely what you were saying, Lisa, about like participation in the journey and crowdfunding does that as well. So I'd really recommend, I was reading your um, crowdfunding pitch earlier, Arabella, and it's one of the, um, it's one of the more compelling crowdfunding pitches I've come across because it's it's strong on story, but it's also super educational. So uh, inviting people uh, to join in the learning process, to help make the clothes, to invest in the businesses. This is the my next project and in climate startup crowdfunding, um, and also to educate through tech, like what you can do, what you know about sustainability, what's underneath the hood, um, through storytelling and data is is really. Uh, crucial to it all so thank you you're demonstrating what we all need to do um i wanted to give a shout out finally because i don't know if you kn knew this uh, arabella mandeep andrew and lisa but you're all on a podcast now as well uh we have launched the virgin startup podcast which is now available on apple and spotify and youtube if you want to watch the video version um i think there'll be a little bit of editing of this tonight before it goes live they cut me out basically um and then uh and then you can go back and watch all the one and there's about 15 of them starting with simon cynic uh all the way through to what we've been chatting about tonight so go back and enjoy those um but thank you so much to all of you for for being here tonight but more importantly for the work you're doing for your leadership for your storytelling for slogging it up the mountain every day together in your case Lisa and andrew um and yeah we're here to support you, to buy from you and to connect. And hopefully, you know, you might employ one or two of us as well on your journeys. Um, but lovely to see you all. Thanks for being here and um, good evening. Good night. Thank, Thank you. you. See you later.